um, a silent film this time, so I will leave background music, please, violinists. <laughs> it's a silent film. Right, so we're to watch films. This film was made in 1929, and it is copyright and um, private viewing only, and that's us. It was filmed in 1929 at the Manchester School of Art, which is now part of Manchester Metropolitan University. And the film is housed in the institution's Northwest Film Archive. The director was George Higginson, who was somewhat of a maverick of his time in a landscape dominated by part-time young students. He entered the Manchester School of Art aged 35 and dedicated himself to full-time study. He also made the first ever film produced in and about an art school in 1929, a full four years before the Norman McLaren's more widely recognised 705. With a life that contained RB and RAF distinction, as well as being painter, artist, filmmaker, and cotton engineer, Higginson was a remarkable character. His refusal to engage with the professional film world allowed him to work freely as an amateur filmmaker and cross genre boundaries at will. Art, science, education, documentary, animation, and news. He had innovative views on film as an educational tool and a pioneering vision of media studies that's who made the film. Now, I, quite a number of years ago, I came across a rumour of this film on the internet, and I had discovered also that Eugene had gone to the art school in 1928 as a 16-year-old. And I wondered, could he possibly have been caught on film? because of the time coincidence. So I went along to the film archive and watched this film. And I came away very disappointed, because I can't possibly be in there. But I bought a copy, took it home, and had another look, and another look, and another look. It was a fascinating film. Um, and then I realised I'd been looking for people who were too old. <laughs> I'd looked for people with beards, for instance. Um, eventually I started to look at the younger people and finally spotted who I believe now to be Eugene. Some of you have already seen this film so you'll know who I'm referring to. Some of you will not have seen it before. Whether or not he's in there, it doesn't matter in a sense because it shows you what the art school was like while he was studying there. And the film goes through all the different departments and shows you all the different art lessons going on. It shows the students messing around, it shows the teachers larking around, it shows them going out for art lessons at the zoo and the out great outdoors. So it's fascinating altogether. So, for the benefit of those of you who haven't seen it before, I will cut to the chase and tell you who I think he is. <laughs> so I won't show you the whole film, there isn't time for that, but this is just um, a bit of a taster. Okay. One thing that did surprise me was how modern some of the girls look. The boys tend to look quite old-fashioned, but some of the girls, especially that girl who was posing as the model there, look incredibly modern. Anyway, let's go back to the beginning. 
and admire the headmaster's teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, we're going back to the beginning. Come on. Right. Go through again. Keep your mouth shut if you've seen this before. If you haven't seen it before, tell me if you think you've spotted Eugene. Any lip readers in the audience? <laughs> Uh, you spotted him? Yeah. Which one? It's in the, sort of the second row. Yeah, it's there in this one, in the second one. <coughs> Which one? Uh, that fellow, that you fellow. You think it's in? Yeah. Any, any second opinions? I can see what, you, what you're getting at, Margaret. It's not who I was thinking of, but... Anybody else? All right, anyone who did know about it, who's seen it before, are you convinced by who I think it is? Yeah. Well, Sorry? it could be this fellow on the extreme left, looking this way. All right. Okay, shall I show you who I think it is? Yeah. Not him. <laughs> <laughs> I've watched this for hours and also looked at the way he moves, because I'm familiar with how he moves.
I'll, I'll show you a little slideshow where I've taken some stills out of the film. Now, is it that one? That's not that one. Yes, I've seen it quite a few times. So she's taking shots. Okay, those are still. As Eugene aged about 50. There are, there's Eugene at different ages, two self portraits either side, and a still of the young man in the film. I think it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, ears. the ears, yes, I've studied the ears for quite a while. The hair, the chin, there's another one. That's, that self-portrait in the middle I've actually yeah. used as an illustration with the conscientious objector tribunal because it looks like he might have looked to, during the war, perhaps with that moustache. Uh, the right-hand one is in the 1940s. Chin is a giveaway. Yeah. What, the eyes Chin. are a giveaway? Yeah. Um, we've got these comparisons of photos and self-portraits, still photos of the film. Um, I'm trying to get some reasonable surety. Is that Eugene, age 17 or 18, or am I just indulging wishful thinking? I think the thing has to buy is the ear, which doesn't yeah, change throughout life. Look at that, look at that in terms of uh, body bills. Stature, the way he uses his right hand. And the left hand is hidden. And the left hand is hidden, that's mm -hmm. very important. When he, when he went out of the room with that portfolio, and when he comes into the yes. room in the film, yeah. he uses his right hand, but he doesn't seem to use his left hand. He can't use his right hand. So I thought, even though I'm beginning to think it is him, I can't go around telling other people that it's him. So I managed to find a Raymond Evans at the University of Manchester, who was a, a forensic, um, in the, look, he, he worked on forensic um, CCTV film for the police and does work at Manchester University. I asked him to have a look and he came up with having looked at the film and the self-portraits and said, as for the comparison between the interviewee and Halliday, there are no demonstrable differences between the two that I can see. There are differences which might be accounted for by the age gap. So I went a bit further and got somebody to age the young man in the photograph and stick a beard on him. So, young man on the left, Eugene on the right, aged young man with beard. She got the hairline wrong, so I fiddled around with it and adjusted the hairline. He looked pretty evil in the middle. <laughs> but I'm sure he could if he was in that frame of mind for some purpose. So the lady that did the ageing, she's um, darker eyebags, forehead lines, nasal lines, receding hairline, sagging jowls and addition of beard and stuff. Could, could you go Took back? Absolutely. Could you go back to that photograph? The only, I mean, it's, it's interesting, the only um, thing that strikes me is the upper lip. Yeah. Which looks very full. It is full, yes. Uh, and yet I remember Eugene in the, the photograph on the right shows him with a much tighter lip. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing I can say. I never knew him without a beard, mm. so. No, mm. no but I have self portraits of him without a beard, and he has a cleft chin, which he has, yes. the young man has. Yeah. And the ears are so similar. Absolutely. Um, anyway, I took the aged photograph back to Raymond Evans and I said, do you think I have a reasonable case for identification? <coughs> and to go and tell them at the film archive as well. And he said, assuming all the dates fit, the face and facial features certainly can't be ruled out. The ageing is remarkably consistent and makes a good image. And with your own observations on these mannerisms, it's a compelling case. And Raymond Evans himself is acknowledged as one of the United Kingdom's leading practitioners in the field of facial photo comparison or facial mapping, as it has become known. 
She's trained medical artist among, and among other memberships. She's the Honourable Treasurer of the British Association for Human Identification. <laughs> and he didn't charge me anything for it. He was interested, he read the Halliday Review, and he didn't charge me. <laughs> and Aurel Prince, trained as a forensic artist and works with the Missing People's Charity. So, I feel reasonably happy that it is him in the film. Um, there's another still where they're both, and a, a photo where they're both smiling to sort of see how the smile muscles um, affect the look of the face mm. and again the, the yeah. sort of rising up here yeah, really seems that. to be pretty similar isn't it mm. yeah. and here's a comparison with the earliest known image of Eugene <laughs> <laughs> myself as a young man and he used to say that his father used to keep him up talking very late at night when he was young uh, until he had velvet bags under his eyes which you have there well, he was born in 1911. Yeah. And by the, if that was 1929, he'd only be an 18-year-old. Mm -hmm. He was, because of what part of the year his birthday fell in, he, and, and also this film was released in 1929, it could have been filmed... Oh, earlier. Earlier. I mean, one thought I had was because his family were in the theatre, he could well have been chosen to act out the part of a, a new student, even if he wasn't at that stage. But. Oh. If the film was only released in 29, maybe it was filmed when he was being interviewed. So that could be him at 16. So he's 16 or 17 in the film. He's very sensitive and vulnerable, doesn't he? Yes. Well, the, what, if you remember, whatever it was that he had an illness that gave him that semi-paralysis which he had in his teens, so he wouldn't have been that hugely long recovered, perhaps from yeah. whatever illness he had, mm -hmm. which had stopped him going on for a career as a violinist, which was his intention. So he went to the art school. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not surprising, he's a, he's a teenager. Mm -hmm. so it's absolutely remarkable to, to have found this. Mm -hmm. I'll just show you that opening sequence again. Have you, but ever, sorry? Have you ever looked at what that illness may be? You yes. That's what I'm working on now, right. after the uh, conscientious subject thing. But yes, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll never know what it was exactly. Mm -hmm. But to me, what's important is what he made of it, yes, what, yeah, how he interpreted it to himself. Um, so, so yes, but he was, he was a youngster. But what also interests me particularly is how he moves and his level of awareness compared with the other students. To yes. me, he looks very aware. Mm. And when he comes into the room in the second scene, he looks around before he steps through the door. Mm. He looks very relaxed, personable. But he's not just sort of rumbling along what's going on, what's happening to me sort of thing. He really seems to be taking in all the surroundings and what's going on. That's my interpretation. I might be reading too much into it, but. Hour for time, Sheila? It's 3.35. What time? How long have I got? Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've got it here. It's about three. The coffee break's in now. You want to have a thought of it once more and then the coffee break? Yeah. 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 <coughs> <coughs> Was it coffee break or discussion? It's coffee break. It's coffee break. if you weren't looking for it, that he lurches very slightly to one side. Mm. 
and that look straight at the camera. The other thing, perhaps, is that if it's correct, they chose him to be one interview for the film. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> question session and we have our, our beautiful beast and our beastly beauty <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and I'll take back to my beastly beauty my beautiful beast. Well, Jeff Stanley, in Abel's brother, used to call me Beastly Bar when I was a child. Well, he would bellow from the garden next door. Hello, Beastly Bar! <laughs> 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 Perhaps I should embrace it now. <coughs> so, I think it's been a wonderful afternoon. I've seen the film of Eugene before, but it was just lovely to see it again, and you put more on than I've seen this time. So I really value that. And I would like to question Alan and Viva to start with. And my, my first question is for Alan. And I would like to know what made you choose Beauty and the Beast, and was this typecasting? <laughs> um, it sort of chose us. Uh, Hepsi had the copy, and she mentioned it to me must be a, be a few months ago. And then um, I really enjoyed it when David and Zero did it. Uh, I didn't realize how long it was. The original one, as I say, comes out about an hour and a quarter. So we knew it was going to be, be too big, but when you asked for, for things to do, I thought it would be lovely to try and do it again, because I knew it was a two-hander. And this lovely lady decided that she'd do it with me as well, so we then sort of um, decided to put it on as close to a performance as we could, not knowing what the venue was going to be like or anything like that. This was truncated one time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, about a half. Right. Oh, half yeah. of it. So it's well, it is well worth reading because I cut all the good stuff out. <laughs> <laughs> all the big words. Censored. Censored. Like, oh, what house is yours? Ah. <laughs> you can't do it without the mark. Yeah, there's more growls in there. <laughs> no paper. We can oh, see it on the screen. Usually you have to hold, you have to press and hold. They have to cool down. I know the fan has to keep going. It's just the line. It's okay, it's going to go. Yeah, thank you. We thought long and hard about the casting, actually, because I knew B was going to do it. But um, I phoned uh, Kevin Spacey. I said, "Do you fancy a beastly car?" And um, he put the phone down on me, and then B phoned Richard Branson, and he, he wasn't interested either. So, yeah. Shh. So, yeah, we, uh, 
that was the reason why, why we decided to do it. And uh, we had to cut it because it was, it was, it was just too long. And was it typecasting? Yeah, absolutely. I thought you fell into it very soon. Thank you. <laughs> so, we could, any questions from the floor? For any of these worthy people? Michael? Yeah, just, just briefly. Have some issue. coming rushing around. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Hepsi, you showed that lovely film. I'm sure you're absolutely right. You showed us just under three minutes. Is there much more of Eugene in it, or was that really the core section at the beginning? That's all I've spotted. There's, a, there's another little section of really the same interview um, scenario in, in another... There's, there's actually four little short films all together. But uh, as, as a picture of the art school, apart from the gem of finding him in there, and there's such clarity to the film, mm -hmm. I don't think this is working. Is no, it it so, keeps no. going on and on. It's really it's, weird. I don't think oh, it's working. It's, working. Yeah. Um, it's just so amazingly, oh, such a good quality of film. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. And, and if you slow it down as well, and knowing what he's like, to actually watch how this person in this film moves, that, it was the movement as much as the face. Mm -hmm. That, that finally convinced me and to yeah. see him at that early stage in his life is is just so interesting, <coughs> really. But the, the rest of it, it shows you the whole gamut of what was going on in the art school at the time, which is fascinating in itself, even if I haven't found it, just to see all the classes taking place. And there's a, there are some really funny sections where everybody's larking around. And there's a bit about the central heating and the stoking of the boiler and then everyone's sitting around with sweat pouring down their faces and the teachers are laughing around and there's a bit with double exposure where the filmmaker films himself twice sort of interacting with himself so it's quite early experimental film as well i think yeah altogether great fun can i just follow that on you said when you were talking um that he after a period of sorry sorry you said that after that after a period of time um, of living in Old Trafford, apparently being of no fixed abode for a while. Uh, he, got, he got together and bought the house in Wellington, or bought nine Wellington Road. Uh, and then you said he promptly disappeared. Would, could you expand on that a bit? <laughs> yeah, I like to throw that in for dramatic effect, but actually what it was... Well, it worked. <laughs> yeah. What I was doing with that piece was I'm doing biography, but I want to make this thing come alive, and I want people to be interested and engaged by being a good read, not just the facts. My, my, my writing group complained about the number of footnotes I got, I've got because they were reading them all. So you didn't have to read them, they were for me. But um, no, I really, I put it in the present tense and I, I, it's absolutely amazing how I found out the names of all these people on the tribunal panel uh, from the archivist at the Peace Pledge Union because in his script it just says, Mr. X, Mr. A, and um, Mr. B, and Mr. No, Mr. F, Mr. X, and Mr. B versus Mr. H. That's all it says. But by the time I've gone through all this research, I have the names of all these people, which was fascinating in itself. So I put it in the present tense to make it more dramatic. And I pushed and pushed with the imaginary fictionalizing. Even the banana is accurate. Because when I was looking through the newspapers, because you think, we have no bananas in the war. At that point, they still had bananas up until November. <laughs> and they were advertising them in the paper alongside the reports of the tribunals. And it was saying, banana, the whole food fruit. <laughs> Go to work on a banana. So the banana was accurate. I found another book which went through the whole history of the stopping of the banana trade. And, and so, so putting all those little details in, yeah, it makes it more more humanly engaging. But the, the disappearing act came from some um, letters that I found of my mother's. A friend of hers had been writing to her from, from the same circle. And she's saying, oh, I'm so sorry. I've heard Eugene's gone to London for good. Is that true? And will he ever come back? And it's not the same without him. And this is 1945-46, around the time he bought the house. I think he's probably looking for work, but he must have come back pretty promptly. But to, to just have a cliff edge there where he vanished, <laughs> I, I thought would bring the story alive as well. Yeah. He did come back. 
of Eugene in London at the BBC, uh, round about where the BBC was in London. And um, I think I wrote this down for you, didn't I, Hedley? Yes. And would you like to tell was, me? Was that in London? Well, it must have been because the BBC in Manchester was in Piccadilly. Yeah. And the broadcasts for Tommy Handley were in London. Yes, there's a little bit in one of his lectures where he says that they used to send, he used to send in jokes for Tommy Handley. Um, Itmar, it's that man again. Yeah. I don't know if any of you heard or yeah. might possibly remember it. Yeah. Did you? Well, yeah, apparently he used to send in jokes and wait and see how long it took before they included them in the show. Um, he could have been sending them from Manchester to London. I know he did work in London at some the point, but, <coughs> yeah? The people he met in the pub worked at the BBC, so he was... Oh, feeding in, the men in the pub. Yes, yes, yes he right. was meeting people in the pub who worked at the BBC, <coughs> and um, yeah. they... Uh, sorry, I forget the <coughs> words at the time. Um, he said it was, it was about putting words in and seeing how long it would be before that particular word became used amongst everybody, a bit like Donald Trump and his fake news. Yeah. You know, and the, the thing that he talked about was um, Tommy Hamley used to have certain phrases which were recognisable mm. all over England, you yeah, know, with Mrs. Moffat yeah. and Caledouille yeah. announcer. And uh, and he said it would, would be about a fortnight before it was used all over, but there was one that came out the next day. Okay. <laughs> okay. <coughs> yeah. yeah, there's a whole list on the webs uh, one of the websites of Tommy Handy catchphrases that called yeah. him and everybody kept repeating them, so some of them may have been new genes. Yes. Yeah. He probably wasn't paid for them. Oh no, it was, it was just something that they passed out around themselves. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. But that's that's discoveries that are coming up all the yeah. time. Mm -hmm. if, any, if anybody's listening to a tape or anything and, and happens to hear something like that where he gives an anecdote about something he's done, I'd love to hear from you because it's not necessarily something I've heard or have picked up on at the time. <coughs> Any other questions or comments or questions for other speakers for us down here? Or for each other. Or for yeah. each other. <laughs> Can I just ask you, in terms of your researches, um, the Isle of Man period, because we, we, you know, we know that Eugene spent a period of time there, um, certainly with Ken Ratcliffe, and then eventually he, he bought a house out of it. So can you just place that for us historically? Yeah, uh, he, he had a very long association with the Isle of Man. Um, the earliest record I know of it is when he actually got married to his first wife, which is, um, I think it was 1934. He actually went to the Isle of Man with her and got married there. Um, and I know he's, he, he's, he's been shuttling to and fro between Manchester and the Isle of Man pretty well all his life. I don't know how it started. I have surmised maybe it was through his parents, because his parents were music hall artists, and they could well have worked in Douglas in the music hall. So, and everybody from the North West went there on holiday, um, went to have wakes weeks, and. People wanted a reasonably priced holiday when they had a little bit of time off work. So I suspect his association may have been life. 
perhaps where his parents were, but the earliest record I have is 34, 1934. Yeah. Do we know his first wife? Who was his first wife? Oh. <coughs> yeah, his first wife was... Um, Eileen Hogan, and she was a member of a family who had a textile business in Manchester, sort of in between the art school and uh, Peter Square, sort of one of those big factory buildings near where the Anthony Berger Centre is now. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, behind there. Um, and during the war, he helped to run. Oh, I knew this from my mother. He helped to run. His, her family's textile business, they did embroidered bed linens and things. He may have done designs, yeah. and I think he helped to actually organise what was going on. And he was a fire watcher, so I suspect he may have been a fire watcher for all that building because they had to have people at night on the buildings looking out for incendiary bombs during the blitz up there with a tin hat and a a stirrup and a bucket of water and a bucket of water. and a camp bed. And some means of communicating with the people downstairs, whether it was a telephone that had been rigged up or a hollering down the stairs. So yeah, they'd be up all night looking out for the bombs. You can just see him in a tin hat. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> I'm just going to say, I'm in Jack and Edward's stirrup pumps. They were still using them when I was a kid. And Ron will tell you, they also used school children on bicycles. Ron? Ron was also a, a runner in Liverpool. <laughs> During the blitz, <laughs> on a bicycle from school, looking for his injury bombs. Diverge. But it's part of the same story. Yes. Yeah. Are we going to do this again? Mm. That was the question <laughs> in my mind. I was going to ask you. Would you like to do something along these lines again? Yes. yes. Maybe, maybe, not too soon. Yeah. maybe not two days worth. Um, but can I invite you please for the holiday view? Would anyone like to write a review of this weekend? Even several reviews would be good because you get to review them. But something about this event to go in the holiday view would be wonderful. So um Postcards will do, or you can email me on info at ehassociation.org. Um, or just call me in person, whatever. So that would be lovely. Um, speaking of please, uh, I would love your papers. This is completely breaking up. Um, <laughs> I don't want to wait there, can you look at your breath on it? Right. Okay, I'll try it there. Uh, what was I going to say? Your papers, please so I can publish them all together as a record of this symposium. And here you've been restricted to your half hour each, but in the publication you are not restricted, you can submit longer pieces, add to them, um, and, and flesh out what you might have wanted to say that you felt you didn't quite have time to do so. Uh, so that would be very, very welcome indeed. Uh, and as you leave, can we have your badges back so we can use them for the next event? If you leave them on the table as you go out. And can I say <coughs> an enormously big thank you to everybody who's been involved, every single one of you, because it's all of you who have made this event, this event happen by being here. And the speakers for all volunteering, and every speaker has volunteered. And so many of you, which is why you've only had half an hour, and it's been absolutely tremendous. Uh, thank you to Anna Wardell and Andrew Moore for helping me to organise this, and Sheila for shepherding you all about. Uh, Derek for bringing his film down again, that was brilliant. Uh, I would like to name every one of you, but time is running out, so just a tremendous thank you to all of you. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I know you're all getting ready to go, but what I would like to ask is that perhaps we could just sit together for a minute.
in silence and gather together the energy of this group because it's been a wonderful <coughs> experience. The energy generated was enormous and I think it would just be nice to hold it together before we all separate and go on separate ways. Thank you all. Go in peace.